Hi, everyone. I'm Matt Martineau. I work at Intel and um, just talking about uh, key restrictions today. Um, it's not something super sophisticated as much as it's something that's relatively new that, that maybe could see some use in security applications and uh, wanted to help everyone learn about it. Um, so to start out with just giving a little baseline of what parts of the kernel key system I'm talking about um, so that we can all make sense of uh, where, where I'm adding things later on. Um, so overall, the, the kernel keys, um, it, it gives you, there's uh, internal kernel APIs and also visible from user space. You can create these key objects. Um, everyone has, every object has a serial number that you can use to look it up. Um, and, and each of those keys contains some kind of payload where the meaning is dependent on, on what type of key it is. Um, and there's a few other kind of attributes hanging off of there. Um, and e each key has a type. So within, when, when you're implementing a key type or within kernel code, um, you populate a structure with a whole bunch of function pointers that you know, implement this key type. Um, parses the payload, lets you access the payload in a meaningful way, um, modify key, well, yeah, set, set up the keys and the values associated with it. Um, and, and those payloads include things like a, a user type is just a binary blob, it can be whatever you need it to be. Asymmetric keys, it'll um, parse X509 certificates and give you access to the, the key material to do crypto operations in the kernel. Um, big key is like is a blob like the user key, but is um, can get paged out, and so it, it um, has some different trade-offs. But um, that's those are the basics there. Um, one special key type is a key ring, which um, has is is a key in every way but one. Instead of a payload, it contains a list of references to other keys. So um, you, you use this to organize groups of keys for different purposes. Um, and this, again, is, is accessible from user space with the um, key control system call to um, link and unlink keys. And you can have key rings within key rings and, and things like that. So getting to the restriction part of things, um, Earlier on in the kernel, like uh, version 4.6 and earlier, um, well, yeah. So, so what restrictions were built for was to, to help manage trusted keys in the kernel. Um, so with version 4.6 and earlier, you could have, um, you could load asymmetric keys from user space or within the kernel from, from wherever. Um, it would, would decode those keys and then um, using the the key identifier, the, um, the signing keys identifier in, embedded in those keys, it could look that up in the system key ring. And if the, the signing key was trusted, had a key flag, trusted flag set on it, then if you were signed by a trusted key, you became a trusted key, um, no matter where it was used um, elsewhere in the system. Um, so in, for kernel version 4.7, about two years ago, um, David Howells, the keyring maintainer, refactored um, that trust system so that instead of using key flag trusted, you had, you could have this concept of a trusted key ring within the kernel and just any key that was in that ring, that was how you determined um, trust. And um, to implement that, he added a, a function pointer to the key rings that just allowed it, it. You attach a function to it. That function gets called when you attempt to link a key. It can look at the key. It can look at some other um, data and figure out, do I trust this or not? Um, so this was, you know, the initial purpose of this was that refactoring of the, the trusted keys. but. It, it was flexible enough to use for other things too. So, um, so extending this to user space. Um, so where I 
came at it was um, I had some team members who are working on the iNet wireless daemon IWD, which is it's like a it is a WPA supplicant kind of replacement. And uh, to do enterprise Wi-Fi authentication, um, there's certain types of that that, that need to verify um, uh, RSA certificates, um, make sure you know you can trace your signed keys back to a, a certain route. Um, and this, this was, you know, fit well with this ability to use other, um, use that infrastructure added for restricted key rings because it's kind of a different idea of, of trust from what's in the kernel in terms of what you want to trust to load a module. Well, this is what you want to trust to join a Wi-Fi network. Um, and kind of the constraint we had set for ourselves on with that project was um, we're using IWD and it has a support library, the embedded Linux library, um, sort of a kind of a lightweight glib replacement that we're building a few projects on. And so we only have those depend on uh, the kernel itself and, and the C library. So we knew the kernel already knew how to do everything we wanted to do. There was just this barrier to, to be able to do it from, from user space. So, um, so I worked on the patches to add a key control operation that would let you set the, uh, the restrict function on a key ring from user space. And so this, this got merged for version 4.12. Um, there's some user space support libraries. Um, so the key control function isn't part of the C library. It's part of uh, this key utils library. Um, and so version 1511 and later has a, a wrapper function for that syscall um, and a, a command line utility as well. And uh, every, every tag release we have of uh, ELL has that function supported too. So um, from, from the user space side, um, using, using the key utils call, um, it's just it's just this one function call to think about. Um, it's just three things you give it. You want the serial number of the key ring that you're you're trying to configure to only allow certain keys to to be contained. Um, the key type associated with that uh, restriction. So um, we were working with asymmetric keys. So this that's the key type. Um, we added two. And then this restriction string, which um, just gets parsed out, and whatever code you add to the kernel key type um, looks up the right function pointer to plug in and, uh, and some ex potentially some extra data too, and uh, sets that all up within the kernel so that then every link operation will be checked. Um, you can do this on a key ring that's empty or one that's not empty. Um, the keys that are already there aren't, aren't checked by this function at all. Um, so you can deliberately pre-populate it and then restrict and um, limit changes from there, or you can um, keep it empty. So um, what's in the kernel today from, you know, four dot, um, I forget what I said, 12 or 17. Um, up through today is uh, just these asymmetric key examples. So um, similar to what the code inside the kernel uses, you can, you can use the trusted keys that are contained within the kernel or the, the built-in keys or the secondary key ring. Um, or you can use this, uh, this second line key or key ring um, with a key serial number. And so what you're telling, what you're telling the kernel to configure in that case is to say, you know, here I'm giving you a DER encoded certificate, only link it if it is signed by this specific key that you gave it a serial number for, or if you give it a serial number for a key ring, it'll search through the entire key ring to, to match the key identifiers and, and match the signature. Um, and you can also, um, if you add this chain to the end, um, it will also search the key ring itself. So you're trying to link into 
um, key ring X, you already have keys in it, it'll also search the keys that are already in it as you know, potential signers. Um, so what this system call looks like for key ring one, two, three, four, five, you wanna say only add signed keys to key ring one, two, three, four, five, and only look for the signing keys in key ring six, seven, eight, nine. You just do what's on the last line here. Um, yeah, so. Um, so kind of the simplest case of how you would validate a certificate chain with this is you, you would create one key ring, put your root certificates in it, um, create a second key, well that, call that one CA key ring um, in this kind of bash-like pseudocode here. Um, you create a second key ring called verify key ring. You, you restrict that. You say it's, it's an asymmetric type that you're using to look it up. This is key or key ring, you tell it who, who has the, the root certificates and, and use this chain option. And then just in order from the key that you think is supposed to be signed by the root, you try to link that one first and then you go on down the intermediate certificates and if you, anything that gets allowed to link is part of that chain. Um, and like I said, this is a simple case. You can, you can make it more strict by cleaning out um, all but the most recent keys so that you make sure you're only checking the signature by the, the last thing you linked in. Um, so for some cases, and in, in our case, um, we use this kernel functionality instead of a crypto library. Um, that was desirable just because of the size and complexity of, of crypto libraries. Sometimes the licensing can get tricky. Sometimes they pull in additional extra um, third-party libraries too. So um, probably the, the main benefit is if you have um, other parts of the kernel or security infrastructure or, or something that, that needs to use these keys, they, they need to be in the kernel anyway. You can, you can use, um, you know, might have more direct access to any crypto or security hardware or lower level functionality that uh, you might use to evaluate the keys that you're adding. Um, if you are doing a lot of these operations to add, in, um, add keys to the kernel to evaluate them, um, it might, might have more overhead than doing it in user space because you know, it takes system call after system call to load a key and try to link a key and, and do all the setup and tear down and stuff. And depending on your usage, you, the program you're using this in, that may or may not work for you. Um, and um, you know, if, you're, if you're trying to do a large volume of keys, there, you might trip over certain things in the, the kernel key system, um, like quotas, for example, can fill up depending on how you remove keys. If you revoke them, um, they might not get garbage collected right away and might hang around using a quota. If you invalidate them, they disappear more, more immediately. Um, and there are other, um, other ways to uh, work around quotas with uh, process and thread specific key rings that they're only visible, visible to one process or thread. Um, so that kind of covers what, what, a, what I've used key rings for so far. Um, next step being to um, add your own, whether, whether adding those for asymmetric keys, extending what's there already, or if you have another key in another type of subsystem or something like that, or, or different um, use for them, this is how you'd, you'd add more. So like I showed earlier with, with key types and key rings in the, in the kernel, We've added two new things. One is a lookup function in the key type that takes that string that came from user space, figures out a function pointer, plugs it in, and then the key ring has a restrict function that lives there that's just, that's the function that gets called on every link operation. Um, so step one, figure out which key type you're gonna work with. Um, if you're adding something that only works with asymmetric keys, uh, probably, best thing to do is add it to the asymmetric key type. Um, 
if you have a restriction that might consider, that might work across multiple key types, that's totally possible. The, the, um, the kernel key subsystem, it just, you know, it'll look anything up based on a serial number, so you could conceivably uh, have a mix involved, but, you know, you might want to um, only, only allow that restriction to be configured if all of those key types are available in the kernel, or you might want to make sure to um, turn on certain configurations um, if that is important to you too. Um, and uh, another, another choice is to not use an existing key type at all, but just create a whole new type where maybe you can't even create instances of those keys, but you could add um, the restriction lookup function to it that allows you to attach that code. Um, it might be good to experiment that way. If you wanna be able to build and load a kernel module, try out your restriction, do something that's not intended for upstream. Um, and yeah, I don't, I don't know whether that would fly with the maintainers if you tried to upstream a key that you couldn't, couldn't actually use for anything other than lookups, but uh, it's a useful tool to have for development at least. Um, so, the next step is just what do these functions look like that you attach to a key ring? Um, they look like this. Um, so you tell it which key ring you're trying to link to. Um, the type and payload in the middle are um, the, the key that you're trying to work with, the, the one that's the candidate for linking. Um, it, it might not be a key object yet. It might be in the middle of being created, so um, that's why you get the, the payload here. And then the, the final pointer to a key is um, like in the, the example of the existing um, uh, key or keyring thing, this is a pointer to the, your signing keys that, that you can look at. So um, like many functions in the kernel, it says return zero if it's okay, or some error value if it's not. And um, if you're calling, someone's trying to link a key from user space, if there's an error, that error gets propagated out to whoever made the system call. Um, some things to, to consider, um, so this, the key ring has, the data structure has this restrict function pointer hanging out there. Um, if you're writing kernel code using restrictions, you, you don't wanna just plug that in directly. There's a key ring restrict function that'll kinda do all the details for you of, of locking and reference counting and making sure that you don't have a key ring that's trying to be restricted on itself through some cycle or something. Um, since since a key serial number can be associated with any key type, you wanna double check that you're using what you think you are. <laughs> and um, there's also a, a useful key validate function that uh, when you're trying to access each key, you need to make sure that it hasn't been you know, garbage collected in the middle of your process or something. So uh, if you validate it, it'll be available for you to use safely. Um, so that, in you know, previous couple slides, was just talking about this is what gets added to a key ring. So the next step is what do we add to a key type? And this is just the lookup function um, that, that takes that string that came from user space and figures out what to do with it. Um, so um, all this, the, you know, the main job of it takes that string, returns a pointer to this structure, and the structure has the function pointer, um, the, the, the key that you're using to look up your signing keys, and um, the key type that owns it, because if you try to, um, say, remove the module or deregister that key type, it, there's, there's some cleanup for the key system to do. So um, let's see what else. Um, and that structure should be dynamically allocated because when it gets garbage collected, it's gonna, it's gonna try to free that. Um, anything else? So that, that struct key restriction that the lookup function returned, um, if you're st adding more complicated functionality that needs more than a single key pointer, you might need to add more uh, members to that structure. Um, and 
Um, you know, just, I mean, it kind of goes for a lot of kernel code. Uh, you know, if, if you're dealing with uh, something reference counted, make sure you're doing it right. Um, key, key lookup um, is, is how you grab a key pointer from a serial number and that, uh, that will give you something appropriately reference counted. So that's that. Um, so where to go from here? Um, this is kind of where hopefully somewhere in the security world, this, is, this will be a useful tool for um, managing any key-based um, things you might be doing with, uh, say, uh, setting up trust between you know, virtual, virtual machine hosts and guests or, or you know, kind of some of the topics we've heard talked about already today, um, in the last few days. Um, something that happened after um, we added, I added the initial uh, asymmetric restrictions there in version 4.20 of the kernel, the, the um, asymmetric key has a, well, it has a subtype depending on where the key came from. And now there is a, a, t, a subtype for TPM-based keys. So if you could add a restriction base that, that says, oh, well, this will only accept keys that have been signed by something in the TPM. Um, you could add other things than signatures. Um, you, you could say, I, I only want to allow keys of, you know, with a certain number of bits or more. Um, because in a lot of cases, you know, the, the user space program is just passing off these encode, encoded certificate blobs to, um, to the kernel to do the decoding. You might not know that much about what's inside them, how big the key is, um, so that, that could be used to check that. Um, and um, I saw the raised hands earlier in the week for people who know about eBPF, so um, you know, it kind of seemed like what, we've, what I've done so far is implement kernel code. You use this string from user space to just say, call this kernel function, and, and you're kind of locked in. Um, but you know, maybe somewhere down the line, people want something more flexible um, that an appropriately privileged daemon or something could add uh, some BPF, eBPF code that could have some fine tunable um, restrictions that, that would have access to um, whatever criteria you needed to use to assess a key. So um, that's all I've got. Um, here's where to contact me, um, some mailing lists and whatnot, um, referencing some of the projects I, I talked about. So any questions? So if we're going to open up the Pandora's box of EPPF in the key ring, <laughs> um, you know, I, I immediately start asking other questions like, hey, can we start implementing something that looks more like a, a crypto API based on, on the key ring to say, hey, I want to like, um, create a new key and give me a key um, descriptor back and then let me use that to do wrap and unwrap operations or derivations and other such things that you would normally do with the key management system. Right. Not sure how much discussion there's been on this, but as long as we're talking about eBPF and keyring, why not? <laughs> sure. I mean, some some of those key types there, there's like trusted and encrypted keys, where those keys can be generated by through a key control operation. Um, but it's you know, I was trying to think about what else is in there already. Um, there are so when you load an asymmetric key in the kernel, there you can. Sign, you can um, verify signatures, you can use that to, so you load multiple keys, you can load um, two keys and say, you know, okay, now verify a signature on a key that I pass in, or you can um, encrypt data. And um, there's, there is a PKCS8 parser now, I don't remember when that got merged, but you can load, uh, a certificate that has private and public keys, and you can encrypt and you can sign using the King Control API as well. 
already. Um, so, but it, yeah, it is, uh, it would be interesting to, to go along those lines and expose more function, functionality dyna, dyna, dynamically. Um, there are certain uh, um, storage protocols in the kernel, like NFS, iSCSI, and NVMe on TCP that want to use TLS. Mm -hmm. um, and there's a certain lack of um, ability for um, the kernel to discover what certificate to use to authenticate. And yeah, okay. I'm wondering if this might be an answer. I mean, the answer that we have today is uh, to build a Netlink infrastructure, but oh, yeah. I'm not sure that's really wise. Sure. Uh, do you have any opinions about that? Um, it, I mean, it sounds like something workable. I mean, you could have, if you had a way to provide key IDs to you know, a specific connection, um, and I mean, this, this kind of comes into play more of, you know, do I trust that? Do, do, no, 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 I don't want to use the word trust because that has some very specific meaning, but is, is a certificate you know, signed appropriately or, or it, does it meet whatever criteria I have that I, I want to use with NFS? That, you, you could use that to say, okay, I tried to load this and it, it accepted it or rejected it. Okay, now that key, it was accepted, it's in the kernel. Now, now it's kind of a matter of just conventional using the key subsystem and tying that into whatever other you know, NFS kernel code is running that you, you want to grab that for. But um, you know, if it's something you're using across multiple connections, you know, it could make sense to load that key once, know it's good, and then use that key ID over and over again. So is that helpful? Or, or? OK. OK. No more questions? Okay, thanks, Matt. Thank you.